well formed we do see there's no uh, paucity of cortical branches on either side so with this in mind we uh, essentially propose the diagnosis of retinomirabile of ica bilaterally so this is just a zoomed up view showing the middle meningeal artery which is essentially reconstituting the ophthalmic via the canal of fertile so this is a ct angiography so essentially here i wanted to show the presence of the carotid canal bilaterally although hypoplastic in nature so keeping this in mind we got the diagnostic cerebral angiography of the patient done so these are the cca runs of the patient on the right and left as we can see there is conspicuous uh, essentially the carotid bulb is not involved and what we see is this streak of uh, contrast to pacification along the course of alleged ica bilaterally and uh, this is the external carotid artery here so coming to the selective injections so this is the injection of the right external carotid artery we see this abnormal plexiform network which is constituting the cavernous ic in the extradural compartment we also see uh, there is no specific parenchymal disruption of flow we don't see any perfusion defects so on the lateral injection we are able to appreciate the arteries of foramen rotundum as well as the arteries of median canal here there's also reconstitution by the clavicular branches of the ascending pharyngeal wow. artery we don't necessarily see the opacification of the middle meningeal artery here however on a later phase we are able to see the opacification of the middle meningeal artery which is essentially taking off from the posterior meningeal artery as we seen on uh, time of flight images so this is the selective uh, angiogram of the left ascending pharyngeal artery we seeing the reconstitution of the cavernous ica via the clavicular anastomosis quite vividly demonstrated here we also see contribution of the neuromeningeal trunk as well so this is the ap projection demonstrating the clavicular anastomosis so this is the left ec angiogram where we see in addition to the ascending pharyngeal contribution we also have the contribution by the arteries of foramen rotundum as well as the arteries of median canal in the petrous compartment there's also contribution by the accessory meningeal artery here again we don't necessarily visualize the middle meningeal artery intracranially the supraclinoid ic and the downstream branches are well formed we don't appreciate any perfusion defects so this is the ap projection of the ec run demonstrating the findings i previously mentioned so coming to the vertebral angiogram as we can see the basal at top is replaced by a plexiform network here we don't necessarily appreciate the straight course of the posterior cerebral artery it is also replaced by a meshwork of uh, arteries and it is terminating at the level of the colliculi by this abnormal meshwork in addition to that we see the posterior meningeal artery here and we see the common cause of a relatively straighter vessel which could uh, represent the middle meningeal artery quite starkly demonstrated on this uh, lateral view we see the uh, origin of the middle meningeal artery from the posterior meningeal artery and we also see the reconstitution of the ophthalmic artery via the canal of fertile so this is the right vertebral angiogram where we see the artery of the fox cerebelli and we also see some duropyl collateralization we see the opacification of the left parietal lobe essentially by the duropyl collaterals taking off from the artery of the fox cerebelli here so now coming to um, 
dissecting the collaterals. So uh, this is our case, and this is uh, an age control, uh, age match control case where we can see that the carotid canals are present bilaterally, albeit in a very reduced capacity. However, in control case, we see the normal caliber of the carotid canals bilaterally. So coming to uh, the uh, foramen rotundum as well as the Vidian canal and the optic canal, in our case, it's quite capacious and dilated as compared to the control case where we, where we see the normal configuration of the foramen rotundum as well as the Vidian canal. So this is just a schematic uh, demonstrating our case. So here we see there's a faint uh, contribution of the um, cervical as well as the interpetus and the proximal cavernous segments of the uh, ICA. So essentially the contribution for the distal cavernous as, uh, segments is by the ascending pharyngeal artery. We also see the contributions by the middle meningeal artery, which could also reconstitute partially the ophthalmic artery. Uh, so literature also says that the ophthalmic artery can also reconstitute the clinoidal portion of the ICA by collaterals. In addition to that, we have the contributions by the ascending uh, accessory meningeal artery, as well as the arteries of foramen rotundum and the arteries of median canal uh, via the internal maxillary artery. So with this presentation, we come to the points to ponder or the points of discussion. So from a purely embryological perspective, is this essentially ICA genesis versus ICA hypoplasia, keeping in mind that there is presence of carotid canals bilaterally albeit in very reduced uh, caliber, but we do see that. And we also see the streak of contrast, which is emanating from the carotid bulb. So the second question is, is there any concurrent signaling which is afflicting the posterior circulation as well? So um, essentially, uh, from an embryological perspective, the internal carotid artery is a much older system as compared to the vertebral basilar system. So uh, if it were a signaling uh, pathway, which is affecting the uh, internal carotid artery, is there a concurrent or a synchronous process which is also affecting the posterior circulation? Thirdly, how do we explain the reconstitution of the middle meningeal from the posterior meningeal artery? So we do know that middle meningeal and posterior meningeal anastomosis are known, but is, is, that, a sim is that as simple an explanation to uh, explain what is seen in our case? Uh, then we also see the dural recruitment, and we know that quintessentially dural recruitment is primarily described with Moya Moya disease. What is our inference in this case? If, uh, if we are suggesting that an early insult is what is uh, instigating the dural, dural recruitment, how early would an insult re uh, result in dural collateralization? Thank you for Thank the... Incredible case, and uh, you know the drawing uh, is is just phenomenal. Did you do the drawing? So it's uh, sort of adapted, but the color schematics and the idea, yeah. Awesome, awesome, very, very. It's a great case. Uh, you know, it's it's one of those cases that uh, you know uh, uh, when when we have something similar, I I recommend my fellow just to spend hours on that case and you're going to learn so much anatomy from one case um if you try really like to give a name to all these connections um um you know i i i don't know my, uh, any any question you have my uh, they they i see here the questions i you know from my perspective when i see these questions you know um the easiest things uh, the easiest questions are the last three to me uh you know like i think uh, this uh, connection from the posterior meningeal to the middle meningeal uh, um, is uh, um, is something that you know anatomically makes sense. You know the, the, that's a that's like a it's a network. The, the dural uh, the dural uh, the dura is a network of vessels. So you know this is a network that in, is need, is in need of uh, of uh, help. Why? Because the anterior the anterior meningeal vessels they're all so busy helping the 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 ICA that any sort of other help that they can get from posterior is welcome. That's my interpretation of this. Um, you know, we, uh, like, this is sort of like within the spectrum. It's obviously an extreme, is a, is an extreme of the spectrum, very rarely. Like, we probably would see something like this, but I think that's the best explanation of that. Yeah, I, I really like the, uh, the fact that you uh, emphasize the fact that it's, the dura is a net, 
it's so important because many times we think, okay, it's, it's a one-to-one, -one, posterior meningeal to the anterior meningeal, you know. It's much more than that, as uh, Max showed in, in, in the paper that we talk about the uh, sinuses and the dura. Um, you know, it's a it's a full net. It can connect wherever it finds the way. Um, so so yeah, it's it's very important point, uh, Eitan. I agree. And the same goes for all these other connections you showed, right? Like this beautiful correlation, MRA, C uh, angiogram. The big questions are like, you know, the, the as Eitan said, like the the first ones. Like, what do we think about this whole process? It's not the only site where there is a problem, right? In the posterior circulation, there is also um, just the location is very unusual, right? Um, it's an extra dural issue in the ICA. But if you're looking alone, like if we looked at the posterior circulation by itself, could we say that this is like some Moya Moya variant? Or is that is that in the discussion? Where like, how do we understand this? Yeah, the, you know the problem. The problem when you say moya moya, the definition is this: the distal supraclinoid carotid, the bifurcation. So, yeah, it's a maybe a variant, but uh, the problem is that you really need the uh, the uh, narrow segment of the uh, ICA intracranial ICA bifurcation in order to say moya moya disease. Right. And it yeah. Um, I mean, I wonder if, uh, you know, we can explain, um, and I don't have the answer, but, you know, maybe someone more in knowledge of the stages of the embryology, like, uh, have the answer. Is it possible that we think that the, the ICA and that sort of like posterior network develop at the same time? So if we think of like a, a, a single moment in the embryogenesis uh, where, you know, that could have given both hits, because the thing seems unrelated, right, anatomically, you know, that that's that uh, co sort of like collicular PCA problem and this bilateral ICA problem seems anatomically like disconnected. Yes, for sure. Um, there's a comment from Nishan saying this is not a true retake, a rete, early ICA insult. Um, question is like, how much, how much headway can we make in these like discussion using the tools that we have? Like we, there is some genetic information that's being acquired in terms of moya moya at least. Like how, like is there another, is there another approach? Are we going to be like forever debating if this is rete or not rete? What is a rete? Is there a human rete? Any other comments? If I may comment, um, I. <clears throat> First of all, I'm very happy to hear all this because this goes back to what I've been pushing for years about, uh, you know, the net, a complete network of vessels uh, uh, everywhere. And I would not just limit that to Dura. I would just say this is true for, you know, any anything in our body. And, and that's why you see all these connections between the Dura and the pile vessels. Uh, that's absolutely uh, obvious to me. And I'm happy that this is another case that shows it. Um, I would say that probably this happened uh, late, not in the embryo, but later, uh, uh, because of the, of the channels of the uh, Petro's carotid that you can still see, that means that there was a vessel there. And if, if um, if the vessel had gone away many years before, probably uh, you, you would have a growth of bone, uh, which we see when 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 something disappears, the bone just takes over. Um, so um, I would guess that probably this was in the very early years of age. And I would not be so uh, surprised if it was uh, something like an infectious disease, for, for example, uh, uh, or of course, uh, um, inflammatory, whatever you, you want to say, uh, uh, it was something what, which happened in different places uh, in, in the brain vessels. Um, so to me, I, I would not go very far far away into the early uh, stages of, of the growth of this little child. Uh, it probably could have happened uh, not so long ago. 
and and of course it's not the rate no it's just collaterals which, which we see at any times during the uh, during the life of anybody when you start occluding a vessel you you have collaterals so so what okay dodi so what is a rate then in a human is there such a thing i would I would not believe in a rate. I, I, it's completely different from what happens in 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 the pig, for example. No, so uh, um, no, I, I would not consider it uh, a rate. No, uh, it, it's well, collateralization, and that's what I believe it is. I mean, in the pig, this is normal. Like exactly, the bottom line is that in the pig, this is how it is. Exactly. Um, and, in and a it's human, a, I'm sorry. Yeah. No. No. Go ahead. So, so it's it's a different thing compared to what we see here, because here we see just what happens when you occlude a vessel. Um, the, the, you you develop uh, if you are happy if you are happy enough and lucky enough you develop collaterals in order to keep the vessel open beyond the the, the occlusion and and that's that's what happens and any time you have a an occlusion of a vessel. Uh, so no, it it doesn't surprise me. The fact is that in children it's much easier to have a good collateralization rather than in adults, and and that's obvious. And and so if you if you're given time, you will see this. If if you have a dissection of a middle cerebral artery in a child, you would probably have it's something which looks like a moya moya disease later on. No, so that that's absolutely what we see. Uh, no surprise there, but it's a very nice case. Yes, the the interesting thing here is, uh, is the fact, yeah, what, what we said about the meningeal arteries that are seen in a different way. Very nice. Uh, what 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 you showed? Uh, yes, I I really liked it. Ankit has a comment about circle of Willis. I mean. Like we only see collateralization by circle of Willis here. Presumably the circle is not a good way in this person. Um, so other things get recruited. Um, but Oh, that could be the answer, I guess. Um, um, yeah, because usually in the ICA, I genesis as uh, Ankit's uh, is saying, I mean, feel free to speak up. If, if, I mean, that's a valuable comment. Um, usually the collaterals are more like, mostly like through the pituitary connection, right? The MHT to MHT or inferior hypophyseal to inferior hypophyseal. Um, uh, sorry, superior hypophyseal to superior hypophyseal. Um, <clears throat> here, um, that is not, uh, is that like, you know, w w why is not uh, the case here? You know, that's that's a question. And I think it's a very valuable comment. I mean, we see like, we see so many like ophthalmic anastomoses and this and that, like basically related to, like the need of I mean, that. one one problem actually like that comes immediately to me is that here is bilateral the problem right usually in ICA genesis you have only one ICA that is la 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 missing so the other ones somehow can supply here you have both both are not uh, available so so they have to find flow from something else that might argue against infection though but I, I not think against, not, yeah, against, I'm... not against some other process like postnatal process or whatever it is. <laughs> and there is the collicular one as well. Um, but then Nishan says true Rita is always segmental. Um, I guess it goes back to the question of do we believe in a Rita in a human? Um, I, mean, we can, I think this is we can too take little a poll <laughs> of this of this interested audience. Too <laughs> too too little of a sample to, for one case to yes. to prove that and uh, and I think uh, I think the answer is no. Um, Other than morphology, is there anything in the rete that connects us to, like you know, pigs? Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm skeptical, but but uh, I'm just like not. I don't know if we have enough data. So, so we, as we analyze the list of the cases that we have, um, uh, another 28, uh, we have these collateralizations and rate as we define it, basically a meshwork of vessels which are finding a way to supply the parenchyma. And then we would have 
probably some more data and some more analysis of how things have happened and probably be able to explain part of it. Yeah. Um, Saba, thank you. And Hima, thank you so much for presenting this. Uh, obviously, we're not going to reach a conclusion today, but but I think the discussion is always good and the case is fantastic. Um, and, you know, I hopefully we're making progress. I'm curious what what's going to happen on the genetic front, because that's there is some promise in there. Yeah, so uh, we are following it up with genetics also. I'm sorry? We, we are following it up with genetic analysis as well. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and we, yeah uh, there we is this finger the protein, right? Uh, I don't know. Like, we'll, we'll see, I guess. Uh, let us know. Maybe, like, you yeah. could, well, you know, email me or something. We could let the group know if something yeah. comes up on the genetic end. Clinically, yeah. are you planning to do any um, any treatment? Uh, not yet. Do you have a perfusion? Like, do you have any like perfusion or any study like that to see what uh, how that goes? So we are planning to call the patient back and then do a perfusion study because quite a few of the cases of the entire collection that we have have been uh, initially missed at the first diagnosis, and it was only when we looked up the cases and we said that these are rete uh, that we uh, could look into the other things that the patient had. So we are not having all the uh, studies for all the cases. So we plan to call them back and do a perfusion MR or whatever studies required for whichever case we are missing it out on. Okay. All right. Thank you very, very much again. Uh, okay. Next up, uh, uh, Vittorio, are you, are you ready? Let's see. Uh, see if you can unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, okay, I'm here. Uh, I tried to share the. Uh, I think uh, if yeah, either Saba, you can stop sharing, or Victoria, I think you could share and no. yeah. So I can. Yeah. Okay. Do you see that? Not yet. No. Yeah. Yep. We see now, not in the presentation mode, but in the. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Good. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Great. So thank you very much, uh, Maxime Eight and everybody. The neuroangio is um, it's less anatomical. I hope to be not to be too much off topic, but it's a, it's quite a special case to me. So I'm happy to to share with you to have your comments and uh, criticism and suggestion. Um, so uh, it's a case of a 54 year old lady with an end stage renal disease, diabetes, hypothyroidism, asthma, and an history of ep epilepsy when she was uh, quite young. But she didn't experience any crisis for almost 30 years. And in February 2022, she had, um, for the first time, a new crisis. So she went to another hospital. She had an MRI and CT scan. And that's the, the case. That's the images of the, of the CT. We can see there's something like here in the temporal lobe. There are some old uh, ischemic uh, lesion in the... <clears throat> and the central nucleus, but uh, the problem is here in the hippocampus, uh, we have some uh, uh, lesion with calcify, uh, a little bit calcified with some edema and uh, something like a cystine anterior temporal, this is the MRI scan. And we can see there's, uh, of course, a cystic lesion in the anterior temporal pole. We have some edema and we have some, something calcified in here that was interpreted first like uh, something like a cavernoma. But then uh, after some day, they, they, they decided to, um, to, uh, to do a control MRI where they injected some contrast media and they saw that it was, like, of course, not a cavernoma, but something like an aneurysm. A giant aneurysm is a little bit thrombosed. And, uh, uh, and so uh, we have here the angioscan that confirm the presence of this giant aneurysm partially thrombosed with some edema and a kystic lesion in the temporal pole. Here are some other uh, images. And what's interest, interesting is that we uh, they found a CT scan of 10 years ago in 2013, where we can see that there was already the aneurysm, but the situation was a little bit different. There was no cystic lesion in the temporal pole. There was, of course, no edema, and the aneurysm was smaller and with less calcification. Uh, so that's the comparison of 
or who changed the classification, generates get good bigger, and we have the edema, we have the cystic lesion. So she uh, finally arrived at my attention in, in April 2022, was neurologically intact, and so I planned a, a DSA study. That's the DSA, that's the angel study. Uh, so it's uh, uh, like the two images. Then we have, of course, a 3D because Aidan and you told us it's very important and uh, uh, and I took some measurements. It was 2022. Uh, so it's that's the filling part of proximal part of the aneurysm. That's the second part, a little bit thrombosed, but it's filling a little bit. And we can see that the carotid is, uh, uh, there's no uh, A1 segment, and the carotid is really, really big. It's quite dysplastic at the, at the end, the termination of the carotid. It's quite eight millimeter. And, uh, and then it's, it's a small carotid in the supraclinoid segment, like 2.2, 2.4, and then she becomes a little bit smaller here in, in the MCA part, of course. So I took some measurement, and so I asked her what to do. There was some um, several options, of course. And uh, uh, yes, uh, well, we, of course, we decide to go for an endovascular uh, uh, treatment. Before, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt, but um, since you have incredible images here, I'm sure you figured if, uh, if there were any vessels uh, arising in the vicinity of, the, of that uh, aneurysm or that dysplastic, uh, like whatever we call it. Um, did here? You, can you... Yes, like can you point if there was any vessel, like like no where is the choroidal, for example? The choroidal are there. You can see there; they're really proximal. So uh, that's the, that's quite a duplication of, of the choroidal artery. You can see here it's going there. So, uh, but the choroidal artery are there. So no vessels here, and then we have some perforators that we have a big one here, and maybe I, if I can remember okay. well, there's more, another small one here, but all these segment here, no vessels. No vessels. No okay. vessels. There, there were the lateral lenticular straits that got knocked off that you showed uh, on the uh, CT. Yeah. I think. Uh, and uh, and the, on, the 2000, on the CT before, I think they were already missing. So some of them got occluded. Yeah, of right. in in this process of formation yeah. of this. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree. Uh, so, um, what to do? Uh, I don't know if there was any other option at this time. We decided to go for a, uh, for an endovascular treatment and we decided to go for a, 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 a flow diversion with uh, coiling of the proximal part and uh, that was the plan to put the balloon there to call the, the proximal part of the aneurysm and then to put a, a pipe like that. Uh, it was 2002, so the biggest one was the, um, was the, I think the pipeline, well, it was maybe uh, the Vista, uh, but it was a silk, but well, I, we, we decided to go for a, for a pipeline that was the, the biggest one was the five. Uh, and we decided to put some hydrogen coil inside the uh, the aneurysm to have to have a better occlusion of this pouch. Uh, so that's that's the procedure. That's some uh, technique I can skip because I have many. But I want to show this. Uh, it's when we decided to put the pipeline. You see, there was quite a nice result. Uh, there was almost no feeling of the pad, the proximal pow, and just a little tiny feeling of the distal one. So that's after the, the deployment of the pipe. It was really, really difficult to do. I, actually, I wanted to put it from here. It, it, it never opened. I tried two different pipelines. So at the end, uh, what we arrived to put was a 535 that was clearly pulled too long there, but it was the only one that I could open. I don't know if this, the conformation, but I took almost one hour of trying. And so it was, of course, not a, a, a nice result. But uh, I renavigate with the to to see to put another one. But just after renavigation, the pipeline just just went a little bit better. It was a, a, a opposed to the wall, and uh, so I had quite a nice result. I mean, it was no no much feeling left of the pouch. That was the control at the, at this time. And uh, so uh, I had to put in mind, it was a four hour procedure, she had an end-stage renal disease, risk of fluid overload. The pipeline was finally paused. So 
uh, I decide to stop the procedure. Uh, so the awake was uneventful, uh, but uh, in the early morning, I can see at five o'clock in the morning, she became abnormalization, confusion, and some abnormal movement. So uh, she did a, a CT scan at this time. And so we can see all this contrast media, also this hyper intensity of the right hemisphere there. Uh, with some uh, residual uh, uh, contrast media, it was not injected yet. So after that, of course, we made the CT scan. There was no feeling on the anatomy. Everything was open, uh, and so uh, we uh, we interpreted that like a, a contrast medial encephalopathy. That's quite common at this time because we used uh, this uh, contrast media that gave us uh, some of this problem. And, uh, uh, and of course, she has a, a renal failure, though she was. Uh, more real risk of this. And uh, the clinical uh, um, and the, the, evolu the evolution, the clinical evolution gave uh, reason to us because she had complete neurological recovery at day three. So she was dismissed at day five and we planned the control at three months. That was fin finally done at five months. And that's where the things start being interesting because that's the five month control. And you can see there's still the edema, the aneurysm, uh, it's a little bit bigger and there's another kist there. In the, uh, in the in in the temporal uh, in the temporal lobe, so we can see here is the the uh, yes that's the, uh, the the first MRI in February and that's the second one. We can see that something's changed. We have this kist in the temporal pole. The the signal intensity changes. There's of course there's no restriction, so it's not like an an NPM or an abscess there. And, of, and she had also a, a, a clinically silent ischemic lesion in the in the frontal pole in this month. Uh, and she uh, and the aneurysm of course got bigger and we can see there's still a feeling. So I went for a control angel and we can see that the situation changes. So that's the, the, the final control. And that's the five month control uh, after the, the embolization. So we have a refilling, but not of the pro not, not really of the proximal uh, pouch, but of the distal one. And uh, uh, so we have this situation. We have a, a, a parenchymal cyst that wasn't there. Uh, there was much more edema. Uh, there's a modification of the signal intensity of the of the anterior one, but she is uh, neurologically fine. She is completely uh, asymptomatic. So what to do now? Um, but we we discussed uh, among us, uh, and uh, I don't know what, what's your opinion. But we decide to go for a second embolization, and of course, what to, what can we do now? So it's not the only thing we can do is so put an, another pipe and maybe a, a longer one or a better one. Huh? Uh, so these are the materials uh, that we chose, and uh, and that's. Um, that's the second procedure. I seen uh, a little. Uh, uh, what I wanted to show is I don't know why it's not there. Uh, yeah, maybe it's there. So the pipeline didn't change uh, between these two. It's almost a one year later because you know times in France are a little bit long. Uh, we can see there's a clear change uh, between the end of the first one and the beginning of the second one. And then what I wanted to show is there's a really stagnation of the contrast media inside the second patch. So something that really, uh, it's it's a good sign for thrombosis. It was not for this size. So that's the the after the the, the deployment of the second pipe, and we can see that I planned to put it from here, but it was really I don't know imp impossible to do. Uh, it took almost uh, one hour and a half. And so the best thing I could have was that one. I could put it there. But I, of course, I wasn't happy. So I went for some uh, balloon, angio balloon angioplasty. And uh, at the end of uh, these procedures, that's the final result. Uh, I, you know, you, you can see it changed a little bit. It was a little bit better. And we can see here is... Uh, uh, is uh, very well, well is opposed to the wall. Uh, you know, the Taina Dyna City at, at, in, at this point is not useful. I, I did I didn't put it because I'm full of artifacts. So it's, you cannot really see, but so uh, really the 2D, Im, 2D images helps a little more. And so that's the final control. And I decided to stop there because it was not so easy to put this pipeline. And in this, day, in this time, the, the work was uneventful. She was discharged at day two and we planned 
a three month control, but finally, but she's not easy. It's, it's, we have to really convince her to do the control. Uh, but, uh, and she's still neurologically intact. So we, we made this control uh, three or four days ago, and we can see again that the situation is not going very better. Uh, so we can see the, the, the cystic uh, Sorry, this is a four days after that treatment. When, is, when was this control? Four, four uh, this days ago is, from now? Yes, it's 21 of February. So now it's 25. Oh, so wow. So this, is a, oh, so this is really recent. Okay, good. It's a really recent one. So it's it's an ongoing case. Uh, it's the last control. I saw the patient five days ago, and that's the situation. So we can see the signal intensity of the of the anterior one. Now she came back to be, mu muco, I don't know, mucinaceous. Uh, the, the other kist is bigger. Uh, the aneurysm maybe is a little bit bigger too. The edema, it's a little bit more, No, still no restriction. We can see that the enemy is, uh, is alive. Uh, we can see the SP level in there. We can see the feeling. Uh, we can see the feeling uh, in the contrast mid after the contrast mid. So what's happening inside the brain of this lady? Uh, I'm wondering, is there a connection between the treatment and this test? What to do next? I do my homeworks. And so I made some literature. I go to the, to the maybe the last uh, uh, article, uh, maybe the most interesting one, because it's, uh, it's like a synthesis of the others. The, the, these, these cases are very rare. There are only 20 cases described in the literature up to now. The average presentation is 60 years old, uh, associated with a raptor brain aneurysm, uh, usually with large aneurysm. The thrombosis is almost always there of the anterior circulation. Uh, and the kiss location is always almost always in the basal ganglia, in the temporal lobe, or in the pontomesencephalic region. And the kists are quite big ones, like in average 3.5 uh, centimeter. And uh, if operated, because some of them were, were operated, it's xanthochromic fluid with gliosis, neurovascularization, and inflammation. So the mechanism of this development of this kist is still unclear, but, but the a real, the subarachnoid, a real subarachnoid hemorrhage, but the role is limited, but maybe the subclinical hemorrhage have a role or a direct exudate from the aneurysm of the pulsation or a breakdown of the brain, uh, blood brain barrier or uh, effects of abnormal angiogenic factors or the ischemic encephalomalacia adjacent to the aneurysm. The last theory um, is there's the role of this edema and the virco-robin spaces with an increased interstitial fluid in the surrounding parenchyma and an impaired Perivascular space drainage pathway, so maybe a role for the lymphatic system and an increase on cotic pressure within this space that leads to an accumulation of proteins and the creation of this kiss discussion. That these aneurysms are a little bit different was already said from by Timo Queens and the, and the, and the, and the uh, Pierre Lajunias uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the keeper of the set several years ago, there's a, uh, there are all the signs to be an inflammatory pathomechanism that's reinforced by, a, uh, and this disease should not be uh, regarded as, uh, as, as the other analyst, but as a different clinical uh, entity. So there's clearly a role of inflammation and uh, of coiling maybe, because uh, uh, if there are always, or almost always some thrombosis and inflammation and edema, uh, there's a lot of cases described associated with coiling and most of them with, uh, uh, with uh, modified coded coils. So uh, in my case, uh, of course, we had every, everything is there. It's a giant aneurysm. There was a pre-existing thrombosis. Uh, there was already a, a perianeurysmal uh, parenchymal cyst and the edema. I, I did an endovascular treatment. I put some coated coils and the flow diverter and tube it, but I mean, maybe the coils are more important here. She developed at this time a new, a new perineurysmal kist. She increased the edema after the treatment, and the anion is still open after two endovascular treatment, two flow diverters, and all these uh, uh, coated coils. She's still uh, neurologically intact. So uh, what to do now? And uh, it's, it's an open question because I have to take this decision the aneurysm is still open, but 
the new endovascular treatment maybe is going to expose the, her to the risk of more thrombosis, more inflammation. So in the in the kistic and parenchymal uh, sides is not uh, maybe the, the best choice, but the aneurysm is there. So maybe the surgical uh, treatment is not uh, an easy way to treat this aneurysm. Any combination of the treatment, I'm open for discussion and thank you very much. Thanks, Vittorio. Thank you. Obviously, lots to discuss. <laughs> okay, let's start. Comments, questions. There was a question about nickel allergy from payment. Um, you know, um, I can see uh, any anything else. Well, there was a there was a comment earlier on. Um, uh, about uh, the pipe, uh, uh, which I agree on the initial post pipe. Uh, it seems it was at least maybe you didn't show us the image, but it seems it was well opposed distally. But uh, the aneurysm neck opposed to the neck, it didn't seem well opposed. But then when you show the follow up, it didn't seem to be the case. So probably you just uh, didn't show us the the post pipe was after you you like no, uh, no, finalized. I, I, I agree. The problem there was the 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 the, the artery. The size. The, the size, because the artery was almost eight millimeters, and uh, and the 2022, the biggest one and that I have available was a, yes. was a five millimeter pipeline. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, of course, there was a problem there. Uh, yes. Now we have these vantages six uh, millimeter, but still, uh, uh, the 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 enemy was bigger than the biggest pipeline available. So uh, yes. So yeah, that's, that no, was a. Uh, there's no wall there to oppose to whatever, like, yeah. no, but, but the, the proximal and the distal opposition is important. Was trapping and bypass considered? I guess you did so, consider but that. But at follow-up, at follow-up, uh, it seems like uh, that uh, that part that was not opposed uh, was not uh, feeling anymore, meaning that probably that it endothelia is there. Am I correct? I I, uh, I I didn't understand the question. Sorry, because at I the follow up. So, so yeah. after no, so it was better. Million, it was uh, it didn't seem to be feeling of uh, that uh, fusiform uh, uh, like non opposed area anymore at follow up no. or was it? No, it was uh, it was better. I mean, uh, it was like here maybe. Yes, you can see. So it. yes. Uh, um. So it seems uh, that part that was, you know, that inner part of the curve, like has, you know, here is better. It's, it's better now. Yes, it's clearly better. There's something there outside here, outside the pipeline here, uh, and and of course here the pipeline is is wide open. I mean, is is not the is not the nice, is not the right uh, part of the of the stand to be. I mean, here the the pipeline is is working better than here course uh, but I, I i didn't know really uh, what what to do uh, we have two raised hands from renee and dan uh, so please go uh, yes yes just um thank you for showing that very nice case and interesting uh very small comments i think the largest diameter uh, flow diverters should have been in 2020, probably the appendix that goes up to six millimeters, just the detail, but it's available in Europe. So, uh, in La Riboisière, yeah, you had it. but it, it was a uh, candice wasn't available uh, in France, uh, I'm, I think in 2022. Uh, we we, uh, we could have asked for a special uh, now is available all the Rivo stand, of course. But uh... I mean, it's it's not the point of the problem because anyway it was smaller than the diameter and uh, it would not have changed. Uh, you said that is very rare. Uh, agree that is rarely reported, but it's not so rare. I mean, I saw it in several patients that we treated, so I'm sure that it's uh, really underreported. I had it in at least four or five patients. So um, you mean the cyst? You mean the cyst? You're talking about the cyst? Yes. We can put it together and publish, Rene, if you want. <laughs> okay, we can. <laughs> uh, I think it's underreported. Concerning therapy, um, acetazolamide, Dynamox helps a lot. Ah. 
and okay. two last patients. So forget about steroids because this is also what we gave in the first one. And then they gained a lot of weight and were much larger and it did not help at all. And once they started to be placed under acetazolamide, uh, it helped really a lot. So try this. I hope it will work for your patients too. And um, what to do now? Because we have an idea, but I want to to to, to share with you. Because uh, I think I think it's time for surgery. I'm sorry, I'm from the other side, or from <laughs> both, both sides. Actually, I'm from both sides. But I think it's time for surgery, guys. I mean, I like it that we push towards endovascular again and again, but we've failed twice. I think it's time, and I don't think it's a very difficult uh, procedure here. I mean, it's a right sided hemisphere. Um, you can do a quite a simple bypass to the um, uh, proximal M2 segment of the MCA and just they, then just take down the, the aneurysm with the vessel distal to choroidals and that's it. You will get you will get cure. I really think it's time for surgery. I mean to that uh, point though I have we can to also, say that... we can also we can also click the small aneurysms at the same time. <laughs> this one <laughs> Uh, to that point, I have to say that, you know, this is an aneurysm in which, you know, I think two devices are not enough. And, uh, and you know, if uh, my point to that is that if you have to jail something, right, okay, fine, we're nervous about putting more, multiple devices, right? Let's say this was at the, at the choroidal, fine, you have to cover the choroidal, ah, we're nervous covering with three or four devices. To that point here, like, you don't have any vessel to jail. So I, if, if I want to cure such an aneurysm, I wouldn't be shy of how many devices I have to put, granted that the government will allow me. Dan? Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to uh, the point that Eitan just made. Um, can you go back to the uh, size, the arterial size slide? Mm. Yeah. Okay, so I, I'm in agreement with Aton that I think that this um, ultimately will need multiple devices because these things tend to be very unstable. Um, but I'll also add that I think um, the device diameter is an, is is an, a very important consideration here, just for starters. And the way that I would view this is that you can't tack against much of the sort of, you know, what appears to be the neck of the you know, kind of saccular aneurysm. Although I would argue that a lot of this artery is actually aneurysmal, you know, in the ectatic segment. If we had a better histopathological definition of what an aneurysm was, you have sort of the, you know, so there's sort of a fusiform set kind of component as well as a saccular component. And when we look at the arterial sizes here, we really just need to land on something that's about a three distally and, um, and then seat on something that's about a three or three, two, five proximally. And so I think that you have an opportunity actually to use a much smaller device, given that you're not going to be, um, you're not sort of failing to tack against perforators, but you have a beautiful dynasty here that makes it look as though when you seat against something that's three or 3.3 .3 or something like this distally, and maybe something approximately the same proximally, that you are not leaving any reasonable size perforators outside of the construct. And so you sort of give up on the idea of opposing against the sort of um, the sort of fusiform component of this. So you're not going to be tacked against uh, like from the fusiform to the saccular kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, border zone, but you don't really care because I would just call all of that aneurysmal and in using the smaller device, the smaller diameter devices, I think they're easier to use. So I don't think that you would have struggled with the piece uh, surrounding getting the the larger device to open in such a in such a you know such a tortuous turn. And then on top of that, I think when you when you go to add more devices, you're taking advantage of the constraint of the larger diameter devices uh, following the smaller diameter devices. That is larger diameter inside smaller diameter. And you're going to get much more coverage around a tight turn, which I think is going to be a, an additional problem here, as you pointed out. The outside of these stents are going to be very open. And so adding coverage here is going to be a challenge. And so I think that like, if you start with a five and you're only putting fives inside the five, 
you may not be getting very much coverage at all if the wires kind of lock in in one another is you know with with the beautiful work that Max has done. So I th I think I might have considered starting with something like a three two five or a three five here, and then uh, doing what Aton proposed, which is you know allowing that 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 it's possible given you know constraints related to to finances. Um, I think in an ideal world, you'd start with, with a device approximately that size and build your way up with multiple devices inside that that are you know increasingly larger diameter. And I think you'd have an easier time building the construct and I think that you'd give yourself uh, quite a bit more coverage in the end. Thank you. Thank you. Dodi? Yeah. Yes. Um, I agree with that. First of all, in this case, <clears throat> In, our, in my mind, the first option is surgery, bypass, and then occlude the artery, and that's done. Um, I, I would not have treated it uh, endovascularly. But let's say you want to do it with flow diverters. I agree with what Dan just said. And uh, uh, you have to consider that uh, what you see, like the the the... the the bubble part of the aneurysm is, of course, just one part of the aneurysm, but most of the aneurysm is inside, let's on the tube, the artery. So I would have placed smaller um, um, flow diverters and then and then the coils and pack, pack, pack and coming all the way down towards the flow diverter, which means also in that part, which you call the artery, but it's not the artery, it's just uh, the aneurysmal dilatation. And so you keep placing coils also in the tube, let's call it, uh, until you really you know, um, uh, occlude that part also. When as mm. far as the cyst, uh, yes, we have seen uh, cysts. Um, and uh, uh, I think that goes away if you cure the aneurysm. So once you have cured the aneurysm, the cyst goes away. How do you cure the aneurysm? With flow diverters or with occlusion of the parent artery in this case. So if you include the parent artery, I think uh, uh, you will cure the aneurysm and the cysts. Mm. Thank you, Dodi. Okay. There are some other comments online, um, some questions about like uh, how to use multiple devices. Um, any, I mean, I, for my part, I agree with Ares. Um, I think it's time for surgery, but I too feel maybe as, as Dodi said, maybe we should have started with surgery, but I think my, my point, if there's one point would be this, that I don't think endovascular was given a fair shake at this, because as Dan and Dodi and Eitan mentioned, the fair shake of this endovascular is like, I feel very strongly about this from the beginning, multi-device, like three, four devices from the get-go. And I know for various reasons, it's not feasible to do it in this day or the other. But, you know, if that's not what we're going to pre be prepared to do, then I think we set ourselves up for failure. Um, and that's not good. Thankfully, she's intact, right, Vittorio? Um, no, no, thank you. The, yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> I think, so. I mean, to do the third I mean, if you're going to do the third flow diversion, you could still put in a three to five millimeter device into this construct. You can still do what Dodi is proposing. You could still trap a catheter. You could still put a three, a bunch of three to fives and coil off that thing in between the pseudo artery and the slower, smaller yeah. diverter. But to do it now, I don't know. Maybe that. Maybe, would, maybe yeah. the onyx sandwich, Rene. Would you do the onyx sandwich here? Hmm. Uh, yes, indeed, I did it in two patients and it worked. Uh, so to add uh, for the marathon, add a new flow diverter, put a balloon inside, and then transform the, um, the mesh inside into something completely closed. And in two patients, it cleared the problem that uh, of the aneurysm, whereas the cysts resolved and the edema too. Oh, so it's to jail the the marathon be between the old pipe and the new one. 
and then to put a balloon inside the new one and to inject the, the onyx. Yes. Mm -hmm. If I understood well. Uh, that's that's something uh, that's interesting. I don't yeah. know here about uh, how many choroidal arteries are there and the location is. The choroidal arteries are there down there. They are below. There they might are be below. some lenticular stri. I don't know if there's any more lenticular striates left. And um, the closer to the it's a stupid idea. <laughs> so I, I agree that from the aneurysm is too large. Um, I think I agree with, with all of you that surgery here is um, a way to clear the problem from the beginning. But now, indeed, if you want to push, um, it may work, let's say it this way. Okay. okay. Uh, Would thank you very much. As it is? Looks like we have good suggestions. Practical suggestions, right? Like there's practical ways to go forward. Mm. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Vittorio. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, okay, uh, Nabil, um, can you hear us? Oh yes, I can. Thank you. Super. Okay, you, if you can show your case, that's also in the neighborhood. <laughs> Not in the neighborhood, but in the discussion, a good discussion to be had. Yeah, you could just, um, I think if you share your screen, it'll pop up. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Am I able to share? I don't know mm, for some reason. I think you should be able to share. Um, everybody should, yes, everyone is able to share. Try it. If not, I have your presentation. I might be able to put it up, but um, um, yeah, see if you can. One second. Do it. Yeah, I did make some changes, so I'm going to try pulling up now. Okay, there. Okay, can you guys see it now? Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah. excellent. Okay. So uh, I also have a couple aneurysmal cases, but uh, posterior circulation, uh, basilar artery aneurysms. Uh, I'm sure we have come across these type of cases. These are not uh, not uh, too uncommon, but always uh, uh, the, the management decisions are uh, could be tricky. Um, so I chose uh, to present these two basilar artery aneurysms. So case one is a patient who is a 44-year-old woman uh, who presented with headache associated with uh, sexual activity. She does have past medical history of chronic migraines and a prior pontine infarct, and she is a current smoker. Uh, when we first met, she claims she quit smoking recently. Uh, so the first scans of CT head, it did demonstrate a nine millimeter hyperdensity in the posterior left aspect of the supracellular system. And the CTA confirmed a 1.1 centimeter fusiform aneurysm of the distal basilar artery uh, with uh, uh, axial diameters of uh, 0.9 and 0.8 centimeters. Uh, and she also had a smaller uh, two millimeter uh, laterally projecting basilar artery aneurysm. Um, so this is the CTA's uh, coronal view and uh, the sagittal view of the distal basilar artery. And uh, uh, you can see the, the fusiform aneurysm in the superior aspect and a smaller lateral wall uh, aneurysm uh, just uh, below that. Um, and these are the angios uh, done in 2017 when she was uh, 44. Um, this is the uh, AP view of the aneurysm and you can also see the icas are also dilate, uh, dilated uh, both the right and the left uh, icas uh, and uh, the superior cerebellar arteries are arising from the dilated part of the aneurysm uh, distally and uh, good uh, pcas uh, on both sides and this is the 
uh, lateral projection of the aneurysm. So, and this is the timeline uh, when we dug a little bit deeper into the history uh, back in 20, 2004. Uh, now, uh, I, let me remind you, these uh, angios were in 2017. Uh, back in 2004, she had a, an episode of vertigo. MRI at that time was normal. 2005 had an episode of right-sided weakness. Again, an MRI done for those symptoms was normal. And for headache, she had an MRA as well back in 2005. That is at least, uh, uh, I would say, 12 years prior to uh, when the first uh, aneurysm was noted. So no aneurysm at that time. In 2006, had a right facial droop. Uh, an MRI again was negative and no acute infarct. However, at some point in 2005, she did have a, a lacunar infarcts in the pons. And in 2012, developed a diplopia and was diagnosed as INO, which was resolved, uh, which uh, makes us think probably of ischemic etiology rather than uh, demyelinating or inflammatory. Uh, so that was her uh, history. And uh, in 2017, uh, when we first noticed that uh, angio, aneurysm on the angio, uh, both non-invasive and invasive, uh, after discussion, a shared decision was made to conservatively manage at that time, uh, we did get uh, uh, you know, yearly scans so for surveillance in 2019 uh, and 2020, um, and the aneurysmal size was stable, um, the same dimensions, uh, one centimeter length and 0.8 or 0.9 in axial diameters. And uh, she's not uh, the best uh, of the patients, uh, and she was last to follow up in 2020, and then came back in 2023, um, and uh, we did an MRA and also a cerebral angio, um, and it showed uh, an increase uh, uh, by seven uh, in uh, anterior posterior and uh, uh, five millimeters in lateral dimensions just within three years, and I uh, have pictures of the repeat angio done in 2023. And uh, has a very good co-dominant vertebral arteries, both right and left. Again, those dilated aicas. And this is the lateral view of this aneurysm. And on the left, you have an early arterial phase uh, in AP and also the dimensions um, of the uh, distal basilar artery aneurysm here. And you can see that uh, lateral outpoaching just two millimeters. And uh, in this, the entire basilar artery uh, is uh, um, abnormal. And I have uh, more pictures, that's a rotational view and uh, of this aneurysm. And uh, uh, obviously we are right now um, discussing about treatment option given the increase in size within three, milli three years uh, by uh, approximately seven millimeters. Uh, and uh, and we, we are discussing both endovascular option um, and uh, not much of an open option here, but uh, just wanted to, um, you know, share the case and facilitate discussion. I guess I have will share one more case, which is slightly different. Um, hold mm -hmm. hold on, Nabil. Before yeah. we go into that, can you clarify how are the superior cerebellar artery feeling? Uh, they are. Uh, so I have a uh, one more picture. So, right there. This is a, a three D view. They are feeling from the dilated aneurysmal segment, as you can see uh -huh. here. They are coming from the distal part of the fusiform aneurysm. Okay. 
the other important point would be to see what the P, what the PCOMs look like. So this, yeah, I don't have those runs, but I know she has a small PCOM on the right and no PCOM on the left. And that small one, I don't know if it can uh, handle the flow. It, it's very small in size. It can grow. Yeah. So right has a PCOM, left does not. Left does not have a PCOM, correct. And uh, um, okay, any suggestions? Let's talk about this one first, right? Like a yeah, yeah. case. Obviously. I mean, first, uh, I would say, does anybody would consider here not to treat? Like, correct. Yeah. Is anybody would say, oh, no touch or like observe or medications? You know, there is some literature about medications. Well, I'm sorry to say that I think this case has a very bad prognosis, whatever you do. Um, and uh, I'm not so sure that, you know, uh, doing anything endovascular would prolong <laughs> the sufferance of, of this lady. Uh, maybe no, maybe the, on the opposite, you would, you, you will. So, yes, I would consider... Uh, just to observe and not to do nothing. That knowing that it will not go well for a long time. And not she's why, fifty why. year old. She's sorry. Uh, she's fifty year old now. Now, Dodi, just for the audience, for the rest of the people, elaborate why you say that. Um, I've seen quite a few cases like this. Of course, in. Uh, at times where not all what we do today were was not available, but I don't uh, and and they uh, um, ruptured uh, with a very bad uh, uh, rupture and and a hemorrhage. Uh, different uh, uh, people, different cases, but all with this very and large part of the uh, basal artery growing more or less fast. Um, and so this is what I think we, will happen. Uh, and I don't think that anything we can do today with probably flow diverters, because this is more or less what we can do, uh, is going to help. Um, on the contrary, we might, uh, uh, you know, kill the patient by do, trying to do something. Um, that, that's what I, I know. I'm, I'm pessimistic here. And and I, I understand it, but but um, uh, really I don't see a, a, a good therapeutic proposition. This is a, a an artery which is completely diseased, which is sick, and and it's going to to you know to rupture. So Dodi, you're not so you're pessimistic not because of the location per se in the upper basilar or the superior cerebellars being where they are. It's more like the timeline of the patient. Yes, but uh, the, the fact that there are the superior uh, cerebellar artery coming from there and you don't know where to place the flow diverter, right or left, uh, and which kind and what happens uh, downstream and upstream. So everything which we could do might just worsen acutely the situation. So she will not die for rupture, but she will die from an occlusion, acute occlusion of the basilar. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm really sorry. I maybe I should not have said this. <laughs> but, no, no. Why not? Like yeah. we've all seen, we've all buried patients. Like but I would like, like to know what Renee has, is is yeah. thinking about it. I uh, hope so, it's a double bearer. No, so, I, so clinically, yeah. uh, obviously, uh, she came back in 2023 because she definitely saw worsening. She had progressive difficulty with ambulation more of subjective weakness than objective weakness she you know to the point that she grabs onto the wall when she walks she's just afraid she's unstable when walking and the fear of fall that she has she does have a, a good strength in individual muscles when we tested and now is using wheelchair over the last year or two so definitely there is some clinical worsening and she's 50 year old she comes to you and says uh, doc, I want to, you know, see my grandchildren. I want to, uh, you know, play with them. Uh, you know, I don't want to, you know, uh, die. If there is something you can do, uh, I want you to do. Renee? 
Um, so I, I agree that the prognosis is not good. I'm not sure if the size has already reached, um, I don't know how to say that threshold for those aneurysms to turn bad. Uh, what I would like to point is rather the first images we saw when the aneurysm was very small, we treated several of those aneurysms, even not with flow diverters, but with braided stents, the very first images where the aneurysms are cured several years later. And I think that it's, um, I'm not sure if we reach already the stage to say we must treat those aneurysms at an early stage, but I'm convinced of this because whenever they start to grow, I mean, just like waiting for cancer to, to disseminate and then you say that you cannot do anything else. So um, I, I'm pretty much convinced that at first treat, at first images, uh, treatment, um, um may help or let's say differently i have several very very similar images uh, of aneurysms where we have the follow-up after several years where they're cured but of course you're not able to know by sure whether it's going to grow now what to do at that stage um the fact that both scas arise from the aneurysm is is uh, not a good thing um but to leave her, I mean, to say that whatever we do is very dangerous, I think we have to say from point of view of flow diverters, um, uh, I'm not sure here that's a good debate between single or, or double barrel flow diverters. Because the, bi the basilar below is not so super large. Maybe it can go. I mean, the important thing would be that the flow diverters both are in contact to the SCAs somehow. And uh, I, I know everybody has different practice patterns. And would you guys, if if, if flow diversion was chosen as a uh, an option, uh, would you uh, preemptively shunt her, trach and peg her, um, before uh, flow diverting her, um, and then starting her on uh, triple therapy? Um, and then uh, what is the time difference between when you shunt and the trach and peg her and then bring her back for flow diversion how long do you wait and which flow diverter to, to you would use anyone Fabaz is asking if we're convinced scas are coming from the aneurysm um uh, i i think so i should have had better views uh definitely uh, the left uh, uh, SCA looks like it was coming from the the, the distal most uh, aspect of the aneurysm. Okay, so if you're gonna treat, what do we think? And 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 yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I mean, is that the surgical option completely off the table? I mean, uh, any areas or any other open surgeon here? Um, yes, completely off. I mean, like a bypass yeah, and sacrifice. I, I mean, I, I not mean, for clipping, not clipping. I mean, bypass. No. The, the clip. no close no, off both seen... words and, and bypass uh, one one PCA or. Yeah, you know, I've seen I've seen all kinds of ideas. I yeah, uh, to be honest, I, I don't think there's good results with uh, this specific angio architecture posterior circulation. I I would not offer any surgical option, including bypasses and all kinds of ideas. I, I, I don't think so. I have one more case, uh, Ethan, if I present, that will be uh, but, adding to the discussion if it's if you allow me to, is that okay? Of to course. me, the question is right now, what can we offer this person that has the least chance of making her even worse? <laughs> like if we're gonna offer something, I, I, along what Renee was saying, like like say we put a single flow diverter in, triple therapy, into the into the PCA that doesn't have the PCOM, that would be the right one, correct? I I I agree with you with Renee. Yeah. What I mean is that is that the least bad option we have? I think so. Will it does it have a potential of stopping this thing? Hard to know. Um. If we put in more than one, here is not that maybe we can put in two into the aneurysm itself. 
maybe, but I don't know. And uh, Nabil, it's Fawaz. So yeah. uh, to answer your question regarding trick and peg versus VP shunt, I mean, I think if 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 you're going to go down that route, I think it's a discussion to have with a patient. Is is she okay with like a VP shunt trach and pegged and ending up in a nursing home? You listen, you're putting a shunt because you're saying she may rupt her. She rupt her. There's a very good chance she's not going to survive this. So that would be a discussion I would have. Personally, I would not trach and peg. I would not put a VP shunt. If push comes to shove, you can always convert her to like a kangaroo lord drip and um, do the trach and peg. Um, when it comes to the VP shunt, odds are if she if this ruptures. The shunt is not for rupture. The shunt is for like like hydro or like controlling the transmural pressures. Yeah, it's not for <laughs> for rupture. Rupture is death. But yeah, if she ruptures, she's dead. I would say even if we say that this may cause some hydro, I mean you can you can always say yeah, convert her to a kangaroo lord drip. It's like on in three five minutes. It's out in an like a in like thirty to sixty minutes, um, and you can put her back on one after the VP shunt is done. Um, at least in my shop, it's going to be very hard convincing a neurosurgeon to put a VP shunt before uh, preemptively. Um, that's just my two cents. No, no, I think that's a good advice. And uh, you're right. You you find surgeons who are willing. Some are not comfortable doing that, uh, but I agree. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thanks. So to give the opposite opinion, uh, in my shop, it would be exactly the contrary. We would first put the VP shunt to make sure that we don't have to play with antiplate. That's where we think that we control, but our level of control is never as good as what we expect. So uh, preventively, we we'll place the shunt. So, okay. So in, in that case, if you did that, uh, place the shunt, how, what is the time interval would you uh, consider between shunting and then starting because uh, we have had experiences so a patient uh, you know after uh, preemptively shunting uh, when we were waiting to bring her back uh, well, and they... she had rupture and 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 obviously died couple uh, of days yeah so i mean we have our everything so we, we we in our practices we have come across all different uh, scenarios so that's why i wanted to see what uh, Everybody would. Uh, how long would you wait? Uh, so operation? only a couple of days. Only a couple of days. Couple of days. Okay. Okay. I would favor the shunt too. Actually, I think if she's willing to do this, um, I think especially in a basal or like or and this and that. Um, if it works, great. <laughs> but if it doesn't, you're so hosed. Um, okay. Anyway. All right, I have one more case. Uh, case is similar. A 66-year-old male with a dolichoectactic giant but partially thrombosed basilar aneurysm this time. Four more smoker, mother with unruptured and sister with ruptured aneurysms in the history. MRI brain and clinical signs of mass effect on brain stem. So already he has mass effect when he presented to us. And this aneurysm is involves the proximal to mid-basilar segment starting all the way from VP junction. And the aneurysm me measures 3.3 centimeters in length and 1.5 centimeters uh, in, in breadth. And here's the CTA uh, coronal. Can you see the VP junction there? And uh, there's the aneurysm. And you can see there is a partially thrombosed uh, portion around it. And here's the sagittal view of that same thing. So there are two PCOMs, even if they're not too big, but both sides. Correct. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh... Here's the MRA, time of flight on the left. And on the right side, you see an image of actually uh, the lumen of the basilar and the thrombose segment that gives you an idea. Uh, and there's definitely brainstem compression. What's the clinical status again? 
um, he is a uh, uh, ambulance with assistance, uh, uh, and he already has dysphagia. He cannot swallow. He has a frequent aspiration pneumonias, and of course, speech is involved as well. And uh, the worsening happened within a year to year and a half. Uh, and here's the angio. So this now, one you have to peg. Uh, this patient was already managed, treated. So unlike the first one, so I'll wait for the group to uh, say what which route they would uh, take, and and I'll tell you what happened. This patient went on to get a second and third opinions, and uh, with the uh, dual trained neurosurgeons as well, and uh, ultimately was treated. And uh, this is the just the uh, the luminal filling that you see. So would you treat this gentleman or not treat? endovascular with flow diversion and uh, wondering what uh, your comments were when you are dealing with a partially thrombosed aneurysm versus uh, the first case where there didn't seem like there was a significant thrombosis and uh, or would you consider bypass surgery and deconstruction of the aneurysmal segment there's no right word correct i'm sorry there's no right, uh, the other vert, there's only one vert, right? The other is. Well, uh, yes, other was is yes. The other word is uh, non existent, correct. Okay. It ends in the spinal muscular branches, yeah. And I think this one, I don't know what they did, but this was, this this is a salvageable case potentially. We would, I mean, you have options because you have PCOMs, that's unusual. Usually they're yeah. PCOMs. Uh, yeah, very good PCOMs and. Uh, uh, and even uh, and the ICAS seem to be um, yeah. arising at the, from the distal portion. So, well, that's the key is that the, you can oppose the flow diverter to the ICAS at this. Correct. Stage. Sure. Yeah. Um, so this patient uh, eventually uh, ended up uh, getting a bypass, a radial graft for M2 to P2 uh, bypass. Uh, and then uh, electively, uh, you know, coil um, and onyx embolization of the aneurysm. I don't have images post treatment. It was done at other facilities, so uh, but uh, I was able to get uh, to know what was done. So, <clears throat> um, so um, first the, was done the bypass, and then they they closed off the the vert process. Correct. They close up the that yes the uh, the and the aneurysmal segment of the vertebral artery completely with coils and onyx. Onyx. Yeah. Okay. And do you know how did the patient do? So patient is uh, four weeks uh, out of surgery. Uh, was seen in the clinic. Uh, still clinically no improvement. Uh, and uh, the follow up angio and MRAs are due. I think uh, uh, very soon. So. I'm. Uh, here, um, Victor, uh, please go ahead. No, I was really interested in um, in the results because uh, what what, um, what we say, what uh, what Emmanuel, uh, that's my chief, always says. Uh, when you see a lesion like that, you see a glioblastoma. So, uh, no no chance uh, for for a patient like that. So we never touch this kind of patients. The first one or this one. Or is the same to you? Quite the same. Quite the same. Because this one, uh, may, yes, of course, anatomically, you can say it's a little bit better than the first one. But uh, at the end, when you see a six months and one year, the all the patients we treated, we saw, we discussed, that are all, all, all dead. So we, we stopped it proposing any sort of treatment for this patient. So I, yeah. I would be very but, interested but, in one year Vittorio, for But Vittorio, they still treat GBMs all over the world, you know? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I totally agree, but this is a little bit different. I mean, um, that's, you can, that's you can improve quality quality of life for a, for a cortical GB, I mean, a glioblastoma and, and, and give three, four months here, here the question here is a different task i think i mean uh... yeah yeah i was just kidding <laughs> daniel um daniel you have a you have a comment yeah so we we've seen how you guys have discussed these cases over the years and then one of the main questions 
when we compare these two cases is, you know, even, even after the bypass, the, you know, we saw that the mass effect from the thrombosed part of the aneurysm is basically pushing the, the, the pons and the midbrain. And that's, you know, that's, that's where these lesions become symptomatic. So, you know, how is a bypass going to reduce that, that mass effect? It saves the rupture theoretically, I guess. So, I mean, I, I just wanted to, to, to ask your opinion. But one point, um, oh, one the, idea, the idea is that there is a regression. If you have a bypass, there's a regression, slow regression of the flow into the aneurysmal sac. That's, uh, that's the idea. I agree that not always it works, but that's the idea that you don't need to fill the sac actually significantly if you're doing that. But also, I would say that uh, you know uh, you don't have to give antiplatelets. So, so if you, with bypass, you know, if let's say mass effect becomes an issue and it's a decompression, you know, you can do that. Um, Correct. Yeah. I so think we need we need follow up on this case. Like this this process takes months and months. Like this, whatever shrinkage we're gonna get from bypass or from anything. So the question is: Is this patient gonna survive for six months, a year, and what they will be like? In my view, this is, uh, I share with Max, a much more salvageable than the first one. You know, this one, you know, with, uh, you know, flow diverter and uh, and uh, triple therapy and maybe what we said, like shunt and so forth. I mean, I, I see, uh, Vittorio, yes, of course, uh, this is uh, hard. The, the, the risk is, is much higher than the average case, but uh, I think there are chances here. Dodi, how do you feel? Thanks for asking. Uh, so in the first case, I would say 0% chance of uh, doing anything which is a good outcome. In this case, I would say 3% chance of getting a good outcome. So maybe in this case, I would do something. I like the idea of the bypass. Uh, and the occlusion of the artery. This is uh, occlusion of the artery usually brings to a, a, a good uh, shrinking of, of the of the aneurysm. Um, even if in this uh, uh, location is less obvious than, uh, for example, in the carotid, cavernous carotid. Um, uh, so I don't know, but I, I like it. Uh, flow diverters, yes, they could do uh, their job. But really, I, so if pushed, I would do it knowing that the chances of having a, a good outcome would be very, very low. Not in the first case, though. Anyone else? Any comments? Uh, Nabil, what did you recommend? Yes. What was your recommendation in this case? Um, in this case, uh... Um, I try to gauge the patient, you know, what what would they want uh, after sharing, uh, you know, obviously the high mortality, anywhere 80 to, you know, 85% uh, mortality. Um, and if they prefer treatment, then, um, and since I'm not a dual trained neurosurgeon, I definitely involve uh, my colleagues who are neurosurgeons. And uh, in this case, we offered a uh, the, the first case, at least, we are offering endovascular treatment, uh, nothing finalized yet. Uh, and the second case, uh, we did not want to touch him. Uh, and uh, I, at least I did not want to, and my colleagues also did not want to touch him. Uh, but he did land up getting a bypass surgery. So, okay. So it was the reverse of the some of the discussion. Correct. Correct. But I think the age played a role, uh, <laughs> although it's not a huge difference between the two patients. Uh, and but the the uh, uh, the patient's uh, uh, perceptions. The first wanted is uh, seeking treatment. The second uh, is not so uh, keen on DJ. He just wanted to um, you know see the natural history and you know just. Uh, but uh, due to family pressure, he yielded into getting into uh, the treatment getting the treatment. If there is a chance for follow-up, maybe we could show. At some I'll point. show absolutely. I'll try to. I mean, he probably yeah. won't. I don't know if he's going to come back to you, of course. He was treated <laughs> somewhere else. But, but no, seriously, like if there is a way to yeah. get uh, follow-up uh, imaging. Yes. 
I'll try again. Okay. All right. Um, thank thank you. you. Thanks very much. Um, let's see where are, if we hopefully can stay for a bit longer. Let's see if uh, Dodi, do you have uh, Fine, I'll just have that. your cases? <laughs> and yeah. uh, maybe after yeah. that, Renee, are you, if it's okay after Dodi? Okay. Uh, fine. Okay. Uh, do, do, okay. So let's see what we can do here. Uh, Can, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, uh, not in the presentation. Yeah. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, uh, come on. Okay, now presentation. So, I... <laughs> I just wanted to show uh, cases uh, about uh, gal galen an um, aneurysmatic malformation of the vein of galen. Uh, you know, uh, usually we see them when they are neonates, uh, and and then after a few years. And I w I really I would like to know what happens over time. And so uh, I start with this girl. She was born in 1997. And she comes at four months because of an initial heart failure. Uh, and that was the, our fourth case of uh, vein of Galen malformation in our experience. So maybe uh, you have to understand uh, uh, if there are any anything we could have done better. Um, this is what we see. So the usual uh, complex uh, arterial inflow into the large uh, vein of Galen, which is not the vein of Galen, we know, but let's call it like that. And this is the AP view of the same thing. And um, what we did at that time, we would place coils uh, in the big vessel there uh, and uh, uh, put some glue in a couple of different uh, uh, feeders uh, to the uh, malformation. So this was the, um, um, the, the the final result, where you can see that it's a slowing and uh, of the flow. So uh, she could um, be well and grow well. And four years later, uh, we would see uh, you know the remainder of the of the malformation, but uh, she was growing very well, no problems at all. Um, at four years, so you have this re uh, remainder. And uh, uh, what to do? Well, uh, at that time we decided to retreat, second treatment with glue in the, in the feeders which we could uh, catheterize, uh, and the final result was uh, even better. So again, uh, glad about it. Uh, here she is at six years. So she's growing perfectly well. At nine years, we do a follow-up. Now we are in 2007. And of course, there is, uh, uh, again, uh, the residual uh, malformation. She's now nine. And we decide to get more aggressive. And if you want to occlude a fistula, you go to the vein and you occlude the vein. And so we went to the through a venous approach. But interestingly, uh, we can see that uh, there is a finer network, which is what usually you see in these cases, uh, which has developed around the vein. And to me, this is not angiogenesis, it's just a dilatation of pre-existing vessels. Um, again, this is the uh, posterior circulation, the uh, right carotid, and now also uh, uh, meningeal feeders, like a dural AV fistula, but this again, this is not angiogenesis. Um, okay, so we decided to go through the vein, uh, venous approach with a microcatheter. Uh, we place a few coils, the ones you see down below, uh, right here. Yeah. Um, and uh, but at this point, we lose uh, uh, the position of the microcatheter. Uh, when we are more or less like this. So we decide, okay, we come back uh, sometime later on, a few weeks, I think. So now we are back with a 
a five French catheter inside the uh, falcine uh, sinus. And from there, we can put more coils. And we think uh, to place so many coils to occlude the vein. Uh, the final result uh, looks nice, no more um, venous drainage. So we think we have finally obtained the complete occlusion of the vein of Galen, of course, because we have occluded the vein. But we were wrong. Uh, and one year later, she's now 10, we still see vessels. What to do? Well, we keep doing follow-ups hoping there might be a spontaneous complete healing. So at 13 years again, mm, still vessels. And you can see that the network of vessels around the vein is still there. 18 years, still the same. She's now 21 years old. And we can, you know, speak with her uh, um, in, in a very obvious and uh, in a way, and uh, she understands very well. She's very fond of us, so everything is going uh, as, as you know, as friends. And uh, what to do now? Well, I think this is about time to try to occlude completely the fistula. So we do an angiography, and uh, uh, this is what we see not so different from what we saw before. Um, the fistula is still there. This is the venous drainage. And uh, the left, um, the carotid artery and the meningeal artery are still present. So should we do something, keep on observing? Well, we decide to, to go and treat again 21 years after the first treatment. Uh, and transarterial this time with magic and glue, trying to get all these little vessels. This is the first injection. You see some glue there, not much. Second injection, some more glue here, there. This is the lateral view. This is the AP view. Lateral view, AP view. Third injection, we are now on the left side here. Um, but there's there's still a lot to be done. Luckily, with the fourth, fourth injection, we start filling all these little vessels around here. And with the fifth injection on the other side. So now we have all this little network of vessels which, which are filled with glue. And the final uh, appearance is uh, what we hope to get. Uh, get. So a complete occlusion of the fistula, right, left, whatever, um, meningeal arteries. And I like to show this to compare the where the glue has gone to the initial image of the um, feeders around the vein, both on the lateral view and on the AP view. You can see all this has been filled with glue. So now we have a seven month MR follow up. Finally, we don't have any more vessels. And a two and a half years follow up. Now she's 24. And now we can say that finally she's been cured. This is was she was at four months old and then 13 years old, 18 years old, 29 years pre-treatment, 21 years post-treatment. And this is the compare comparing 13 years to 24 years. Why do I show this? Just to show that she took 21 years to get cured. Not the best we could do, of course. Um, if I can go on, uh, I would show very quickly uh, this case, a 47 year old man, uh, vein of Galen aneurysmatic malformation recognized when he was nine months old. 
so 49 years before. Nothing is done except the VP shunt at a certain point, living a normal life ever since. But recently, some difficulties in speaking and in standing and walking. And so this is what we see. A, a very a huge dilatation uh, in the center of the head, but more importantly, diffuse calcification in the uh, gray-white matter boundary. As a result of the disruption of the hydrovenous balance, a consequence of the shunt, maybe. Um, so in November uh, 2017, uh, she does, he does another control, and but it's clinically worsening. So we proceed with an angiography, and this is what we see. It looks like a, a VGAM of the mural type. This is the vein, uh, draining uh, uh, drainage of the fistula, no uh, straight sinus. This is the EP view, same thing. So we go on with the treatment, very simple treatment. We go, we get inside the sac through this uh, large vessel here, and we place a few coils and, and a little drop of fill at the end of the, at the, um, yeah, uh, at the fistula point. And, uh, but also he had some dural AV fistulas in the frontal area. This is the right AP and lateral view. AP, a lateral view of the left. Um, this is the super selective imaging of a, a, an anterior meningeal artery showing, yeah, the, the, the fistula here into, into cerebral veins. So uh, we decided to include that also with fill. And here you can see the fill in the frontal area for the dural fistulas and the cause for the vein of Galen malformation. Um, right hemisphere veins at the end of the treatment, left hemisphere, posterior fossa. So veins, of course, uh, uh, stagnating, uh, large and, and, and dilated. Uh, but luckily enough, uh, uh, he went well. At 24 hours, all well, all normal, new neurologic problems. And uh, this is the MR post. At 14 months, no more deficits, all well, and no more flow inside the big pouch. So this is where you would see the uh, before and after one year after the treatment before and at one year, no more flow. And you can see also the uh, dilatations of the vessel, which went down and away. So finally, uh, this lady, she was 37 asymptomatic in 2009. She presented with this at 37 years old. For the lovers of vascular anatomy, you can see this uh, pica vessels which come from the ascending pharyngeal directly. Uh, at the time the neurosurgeon decides for observation, she lives her life with no problems. She has two kids. 15 years later, two days ago, she is now 52. We see a hemorrhage. So she comes to the hospital with a hemorrhage. Um, so the questions to debate is, for how long can you live a normal life harboring a vein of Galen malformation? Is it worth to treat all vein of Galen malformation at some point? At what point? Is it worth to try to arrive at total cure? Thanks. Thank you, Dodi. Um, I have another question, though, like, uh, are these, uh, um, okay, let's put it this way. What's the, where is a, where, where is the end between a dural arteriovenous fistula, a galenic dural arteriovenous fistula and a vein of Galen malformation? You know, like where is, like how, you know, especially, you know, in the older population, adult population, like, are we, 
uh, is it a difference between these conditions there when we try to interpret them or? Yeah, absolutely. I think so. These cases as you have seen, maybe I should take them a bit again. Um, as we've seen, so you, here you have a typical uh, big pouch with a false sign sinus with all the uh, choroidal artery going into it. And uh, uh, the meningeal arteries uh, are, uh, let's say, secondary, uh, not the first option. And this is uh, the same. So this is uh, the last case I showed you. The, the same is uh, this case, no? I, I would not consider this a dural AV fistula of the uh, falco tentorial junction at all. Uh, this is uh, very much a... a so it's about, it's about the venous outflow. Here it's then we don't see that straight sinus, so it goes this way and then this way. I don't know, almost everywhere. Um, uh, I don't know if I, uh, what was your question about the venous outflow. So uh, yeah, um, if you if you saw this in, in a neonate or a very small child, you would have no doubts, right? No doubts. No, but that's my that's my 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 point here. Like, uh, like you know. How in an adult, like when we try to yeah. distinguish this, you know, you're saying essentially this is a single, seems like a single, first of all, a single whole fistula and uh, uh, the venous drainage is through like the false sinus, you know, those those would be the reason to drive, to, to you know, decide one diagnosis versus the other. Granted, the, that it doesn't make a difference, right? And because... the choroidal arteries are the most prominent uh, feeders. Uh, more so than um, yeah, dural vessels, yeah, the, 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 than the meningeal, uh, which we usually. See. I agree that there are some cases where you may be in doubt. Yes, I agree. Not these cases that I showed you, but uh, sometimes you mm, um, maybe I've seen three or four cases of adult uh, AV fistulas in that region, where I would. Not so sure uh, um, if it was one or the other. Yes, I agree with that. Dori, yeah. To come back to your question, it seems yeah. like like we don't do so many kids. Like you have like vastly more experience, and I think others in the audience do. But in terms of like the classic uh, Los Johnias like like approach. These seem to be the compensated type, right? Like they made it to adulthood because of whatever. Somehow they were compensated cardiovascularly. And the approach in, within that system is to treat them when they were children, right? Like six months, one year, whatever. At some point when they're slightly bigger than neonates. So is your question then like, like why not follow this approach? One of them did well. One of them obviously did very badly. Um, just with natural history. So is it easier to treat them when they're children, when they don't have their own children and so forth? Yeah, but not everybody agrees with that. So I, I would say when I see a, um, a vein of Galen malformation in a child, I would go for treatment, yeah, before the first year of age, uh, if possible. If, even if it, there are no problems, uh, uh, no no consequences on on the cardiovascular system, um, but I, I know that many people will say no. And first question, and sometimes you see these cases in adulthood. So the lady, she was con um, uh, found uh, uh, when she was thirty seven years old, uh, and the and and the fistula was not that simple to treat. I, I agree. Yeah, so it, it's a little bit different, um, but but certainly uh, the, the idea also the problem is also that oftentimes you treat the kid when uh, he needs uh, when he's a neonate. Absolutely, it's needed to to be treated uh, because of, of the problem of the cardiac uh, problem. But then there is a leftover. You you don't. It's not completely treated. Yeah, you have saved the life of the of the child because uh, he goes back to a normal life, but there is still some fistula left, and that's my the main point of where I don't know what to do, uh, how often we should and how much we should push for complete treatment of the fistula, 
and th th that's more questionable. Uh, maybe Rene, you have the answer. Uh, I, I don't pretend to have the answer, but I've got an opinion at least on this. First of all, thank you for showing this because it shows point one, uh, the evolution of techniques, definitely. And point two, it shows also that it's an aggressive disease. So whether you call it angiogenesis or development of pre-existing vessels, I think both of you, you and Alex would be right in saying that, I mean, you see a lot of other vessels or tiny vessels that get very large and that get each time more and more difficult to treat. So uh, was it possible? I mean, Pierre Lajonia showed um, put a lot of things here in, in treatment at the, um, at the neonate stage but we don't know what happened after. And a lot of those children have um, um, remaining lesions where it's difficult to handle. So I'm pretty much convinced that it's an aggressive disease that requires aggressive treatment. And um, as you showed also, a treatment can only be achieved when in the end it's treated by the vein, because the more it recurs, the more the choroidal vessels are at high ischemic risk. And we've been treating, um, so in, in Sinai with uh, Alex and Joanna, uh, between five and 10 that were cured, I treated in Nesson also between five and 10 by successive serial transarterial embolization until it became very small and then finished by the vein. I think there's no other way to cure those children and really, it's a major change <laughs> once it's done, when it's cured. Um, stories of uh, delayed bleeding after many years are existing, but it can be also earlier. Uh, other children at five, six, or seven of age have bleeding because there was a small remnant, and nobody's excited in treating the remnant, but the remnant it uses many issues. But I think that today, um, the combination, I mean, the evolution of techniques makes it possible to have most of them cured. I don't want to sound over optimistic, but really, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty much convinced of this, that all of those can be cured. Yes, one, one thing was that it, it's usually, usually um, we hear uh, saying that they will never hemorrhage they will just grow if possible but will never hemorrhage and, th and that's that was one of my points here just saying no look uh, you will have hemorrhages from this um, yeah thank you Dario yes thank you uh, thank you Dodley it was beautiful as always uh, I <laughs> I, I I have, a, I have, I have an anatomical question. I mean, the shunts is a choroidal. Shunt. I've seen some, we, we, I, I work in an in a, in a adult hospital, so I don't have this much experience. But I've seen some when I, when I was, uh, I spent some time with, uh, with Doctor Rodesh. And the, the, the question is, the, 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 the choroidal shunt is, a, is a, on the median prosencephalic vein. I think, I, I, of Markowski, I think, but it's a vein. It's not a dural sinus, isn't, isn't it right? Uh, uh, I mean, in 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 the ana in an anatomical point of view. So, it's, if it's a chant on the vein, I mean, I think I totally agree with you, Dodi. The first problem when I, when there's a when a newborn and a child, the point is to save his life or the heart failure and so on. But later on, once you have saved his life, at the first, the, the very beginning. That's, that's the second point. That's if the shunt is is on the vein, and and I, is a real question here. Is not on a dural sinus. So is is something that can can hemorrhage during lifetime, and and you show that it can it can bleed. So um, it's not like a type one dural fistula. I mean, uh, it's 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 a shunt on a vein, and so see if something happens. Down, downstream on the on the venous drainage that can increase the pressure so it can bleed so I totally agree uh, with with Renee it's an aggressive disease and uh, maybe 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 the the, the 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 point is that we we should we should go for it I don't know so we do we agree that if you have to go for it and to try to completely cure it should it the the, the sooner the better. 
in order not to let all these uh, new vessels uh, develop, first of all. And also, from a, a sociological and parental point of view, it's different if you lose a, a child who's uh, six months old rather than a child who's seven years old or, or, or 12 years old. Um, so if you have to risk something in the treatment, uh, probably, I, I don't know if this is a cynical comment, but it's better to 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 have this risk before it's, you know, the, the, the child has grown up to be more, you know, loved more, let's say, uh, in a bad way. Dodi, no, I, I think if Kim was here, I will speak for Kim because I know he would agree with you. So I, I speak for him because I know he feels strongly that way, that it's better to take the risk early, not so early that they're like have femoral axis issues or whatever, but from that perspective, and also from the perspective of brain recovery too. Like, I think that's also true. Um, that's, you know, so that's in the few cases we've done, we have gone with that philosophy that it's better to do it early. And the last point is the more you wait, um, the more the situation gets difficult because of further unaccessible arteries. So it's a very important point indeed not to wait. I mean, I, I wait the age of one year because one year there's enough of mass volume <laughs> to inject more contrast to have better access, but then not to wait uh, the age of five, six or more because um, the malformation will have either grown or um, uh, transformed. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, Dori, thank you so so much again. Okay, uh, Renee, if you, you if you are ready. Okay, I'm ready. Here, I would like to share this patient here, which is a. Uh, uh, medical student um okay i hope you can see it uh, now 24 year old who had the first thrombosis of the right lateral sinus uh, in 21 and who had a second thrombosis this time of the other sinus in 23 and potentially the reason for this, he makes some muscle grow stuff, <laughs> uh, doing muscular exercise, taking some testosterone boosters, anabolizant, um, because all the hemostasis examination that have been done were normal. And here are the corresponding pictures. Three years ago, right side is gone. You see here the clot. Two years later, left side is gone with all the accompanying symptoms with the fresh clot on the left side. And then 24, being a uh, 24, he has this imaging where you can see here, I'm scrolling through the pictures, you may see super sagittal sinus and then getting down, you see both lateral sinuses that are about to come soon that are here, okay? And now we have the same thing on CTA. The reason why he got all this imaging is that he's not doing fine. He's got still very strong headaches. He got um, multiple lumbar punctures, more than 10, with a hyper pressure measured at 41 millimeter. You see both sinuses to be seen here, which are somehow okay. So um, he is taking also um, Diamox, acetazolamide, uh, five, gram, five grams per day, which is twice maximal doses. That's why it's almost with some metabolic acidosis. Uh, but that's a way for him to be better. Each time he gets a lumbar puncture, is good for three days, and then symptoms come back. So the question was raised what to do. 
And um, as we've been facing a couple of similar situations, we were reluctant to believe that the sinuses were as good as they seem to be on this picture here, where obviously all sinuses are good. But if we go to... Um, How was he treated, Rene? Uh, was anticoagulation the previous... Okay. I mean, he first had a so different anticoagulation. He, he had the, the usual things. He saw different hematologists. The treatment was changed for second one in compared to first one. So I think first one, he just received aspirin because now it's trend just to give aspirin. Second one, he was on Coumadin um, with some changes, of course, when he had it uh, again on the other side. And the problem is since um, second sinus venous thrombosis, which was, which was middle of last year, he's, he's going from hospital to hospital and doing extremely badly. He is, however, uh, the, the ophthalmologist found out that uh, papillary edema has shrunk. He does not have as much papillary edema as he had during thrombosis number two, but he still has a major intracranial hypertension. And the question is, why does she have? Does he have this intracranial hypertension? Our so, experience with these sinuses is that they might look normal, but they're not really normal. I, and this is and, what we expect to do. So I want to show his angiogram, and I'm going to ask for your opinion what to do. Here is posterior circulation. Here is the right ICA. And okay, I show also some lateral views just to make sure that super sinus and trend and straight sinus are fine. And left ICA is here. So, so what's next? What would you say? I would say to try to measure, to go through these sinuses, uh, which might be like there's the one on the left looks like it's like the recanalizes in this cavernous manner. See what the pressures in those things are, um, if possible to do that. I don't know. Absolutely. Indeed. Uh, that That's the amazing thing is that CTA and MRA are absolutely brilliant. But when we measured the pressure, first of all, we went to the right side. It was not so easy to go through the right side. It was not straightforward. And here are the values. And that's the better looking side. And the right one is exactly the and better. it's hard to go through that. So we, we managed to find a way, but it was um, extremely ugly to navigate. The catheter always wanted to go very much on the wall, not to stay in the middle of what you consider to be the lumen. And I mean, we found image. a very strong gradient of uh, 19 to 20 millimeter. An expression of uh, some sort of like venous outflow problem is also this, the collateral veins, superficial and uh, uh, diploid veins are a little more, much more, I would say, than, than a normal situation. So that's another indirect expression of that problem. I, I totally agree on the picture here. You can see that there's a transcranial outflow, which may be seen, but here it's extremely important. You see that he uses superficial temporal veins bilaterally. So he was offered now to get a shunt no. in order to avoid having a lumbar puncture every couple of days. The other anatomical point, sorry, Rene, just so many yes. things, is that you see how the cavernous sinus is not well pacified here. So some people, if they have a good cavernous sinus, they can live on this, no problem. But uh, if they don't, it's not so good. So you're saying congenitally, probably this person doesn't have a good connection with them. Yeah, right? they have a cavernous sinus, I'm sure, and the externals may be draining there, but like the superficial sylvian, the sylvian veins are not, doing good with that so he has to rely on these other things um so what's next should we leave it should we pta 
or should we stand PTA? Okay. I mean, is shant a bad idea? What about a shant? Or shant a better idea? I think here, because you were able to get through the right side and because there's a gradient, I think stenting the right side, I think could I think could could work. Uh, there is a gradient. There is a way through. Um, you know, I think that's. I would say that's reasonable. Uh, th that's what we consider too. Um, in, in fact, is recanalized sinus. We don't we don't know a lot about recanalization of sinus after sinus venous thrombosis. So there's very poor information on literature. Uh, and even when literature says something, a recanalized sinus is what appears to be more than 50% of normal sinus. So it's just nothing. It's, it's extremely poor. So we have been doing this since um, about 20 years in a couple of patients. And that's why we did it here. He has some jugular veins you see here. So access was somehow okay on the right side. Um, but look again, when the cat was placed here, how much we see that it goes immediately um, transcranially. So we PTA'd extensively, first starting with smaller balloons, three to four, and then up to seven to eight millimeter. Also super sagittal in case of doubt. What, what kind of balloon? Oh, some peripheral balloons. Peripheral, okay. The first high, high pressure balloon. Yes, high pressure balloons. High pressure balloons. And once the right side was done, I wondered whether I should not also treat the left side. But to go through the left side, maybe the pictures here show how much this is diseased. And for me, it's the most striking fact here in this patient to see the huge difference between imaging, um, non-invasive imaging that looks absolutely brilliant, regardless CTA or MR, MR, but it's contrast agent. And I think that what we see here are some synesia, some, some fibrotic scars that also take contrast agent. And that's why probably they're completely missed on regular imaging. So right side to recanalize was quite simple. Left side, it took me one hour and I could go down here, but then to go down this way, I, I just could not. I had to puncture the left jugular. And then once I went to the left jugular, here you see, I still did not make it through the left jugular, I could reopen and finally uh, get an access through both sides to, well, when I reach this, when we stand only, I mean, I've been doing this in one child who was indeed very good, but it was a very focal stenosis. Here I considered that I should stand extensively. So here are wall stands. I put three wall stands, seven by 50, which then look like this. And I wondered whether the right side would not reocclude. As soon as the left side was open, the flow was so important on the left side that I feared that the right side would occlude also. That's why I um, placed stents on a symmetric way. I mean, one less on the right side, but it was not required. And, and um and the patient was fine indeed. Uh, we stopped the dimex completely. He was indeed very good. Here are the um, last angiograms. Did you measure pressures at the end? Um, we did not, but um, we were sure that it was normal. We did it a couple, in a couple of other patients where then it went back to normal. And here uh, we saw very few transcranial veins. Uh, this is left side, same from the other side. And indeed, his symptoms resolved. Um, we stopped Diamox. We gave him dual antiplatelets, so aspirin and prasugrel. At day five, he had minor headaches, so we made a control angiogram. Then right side was very good, but left side was occluded. <laughs> so... I wonder what I sh should have done here. The fact that he had a good outflow on the right side was a positive thing, <laughs> but was it really good to leave it like this? So finally, I preferred to reopen it again 
taking a combination of different devices of three stent rivers and aspiration. So this is after recognition on the left side. I prolonged the stent here. I wondered whether here it was very, uh, very tightly closed and maybe I did not stand it up the first time. So here is um, um, the retreatment, first taking off the clots and putting some additional stents and then change medication from aspirin and prasugrel to aspirin and coumadine. Um, and indeed, since then, he's, he's very good. He has no symptoms anymore. Um, he stopped um, acetazolamide. So I don't have long follow-up, we're gonna see. So was it correct here to PTA? I think the future is going to tell us. Was it correct to stand one side? Um, I would say um, probably yes. <laughs> At least one side remained open. Was it correct uh, to stand both sides? I, I really don't know. The fact why I stented both sides is that I fear that if I would have stented just one side, the other one would have gone. But it's not because you open two doors that the brain is going to use them. So I don't know whether it was correct. In other patients where we did both sides, it remained open, but here it did not. At least uh, there's one thing which I'm sure it's don't rely on imaging. Thank you. Now, um, a very, very interesting case, lots of lessons. Now, I have to say, when you went through the CTA, I, I, you know, certainly like at first glance, it seems clean and beautiful, but there are some like little dirt. It looks like a little dirty, uh, especially the left side, you know, and, and the reason why it's important is because now like prospectively, you know, when we see this patient trying to understand from cross-sectional, like what are we dealing with? Maybe like, you know, those kind of subtle, like little dirty appearance may be a sign that we're dealing with not a good signs. You're totally right, but still, um, I mean, he's in a very medical environment. A lot of uh, very experienced neurologists looked at his imaging and said, uh, there is nothing really to offer because uh, everything is open. And it just means that what we see on CTA and MRA is extremely difficult to appreciate. And we're, in other words, we're not able to see whether there is some fibrotic issue in the sinus that completely compromises the flow. Renee, I think, I think this is the rule, not the exception. I completely agree with you. I have also several cases. I have, I have had more difficulty going through these things. I have like twice I tried, I couldn't. But um, but this is what happens. Like, I really think that this is how they heal with like medical treatment. And of course, it's difficult because that's the standard of care we have right now. At this moment, we have a patient that we don't have time. Maybe I'll show maybe in the next banana. We have a patient right now in the hospital where we did thrombectomy and then put in. Um, we, we have a couple of cases where we do in the acute phase, like direct intrasinus TPA infusion. Because in our limited experience, the results in geographically and clinically are fantastic. Like they have their normal sinuses back so far, um, as opposed to like this kind of mess that 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 you have to deal with. So, but of course, this is like not the standard of care by any means. And what to do with that, how to push that forward. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's completely underestimated. Uh, there is no literature on this. And literature is based on, I mean, argument for medical treatment of sinus thrombosis. It's just because most patients do fine, but how fine are they? And the thrombus does not, does not just uh, vanish and disappear. It leaves scars. And these are the scars we're dealing with. Now, hopefully, with, obviously, there's like so much more emphasis on venous disease that people will like the more appreciation of what happens to these people in the long term, just like the Galen's, they don't die, but they are not so great either. There's a lot of uh, questions and comments in the chat, like related to like what is, should be the anticoagulation management or antiplatelet for how long. Mm. Do you There's have any... Victoria also who will raise this end. Unmute herself, Victoria. So he had yeah. no 
Yes, I'm just reading the questions. No, he had no tinnitus. We asked him, we put our stethoscope around to hear something. No, he had no tinnitus. But um, he could have, or he should have. <laughs> well, no, well, not necessarily, because the flow through these things, through all these channels, is not very much. So unlike the one that has like a big sinus with a stenosis and like everything has to squeeze through this hole, I'm not sure. But tinnitus is so unpredictable. Um, I agree. Yeah, tinnitus uh, maybe. Is, uh, but uh, thank you very much. It was super interesting. Uh, I, I totally agree. We we don't have to rely on the on the images. I mean, the most important thing was the. I mean, the most important information in my point of view, in my experience, was the was the was the pressure gradient. And 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 of course the, the the clinical symptoms. So something was going there in in, in this sinus uh, thrombosis and then recanalized. There's just a flow inside this this septa inside the sinus, and uh, uh, so we adjust an image. And we try uh, we tried twice, and uh, and I'm impressed how you managed to reopen because we 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 couldn't actually open the sinus like like you. You did. Uh, uh, we tried to open the stent. It, it, just, it remained very, very not well open. So finally, uh, almost in one case, it, it ended up in, uh, in 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 the shunt because it was uh, it was clinical symptomatic. But um, I mean, the, the most important thing, I mean, in my opinion, is that if there is a pressure gradient like in your patients, we will always be symptomatic. And, and so uh, it was not really open. It was just an image. Was not a, not 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 the real information on the CT scan or on the MRI. So I see some questions concerning medication. Usually after stenting, we give dual antiplatelets for one month and aspirin for one year, and stopping at one year, we never had any problems. Here, uh, I don't know why he occluded one side. Uh, uh, maybe it was just too much veins, too many veins. <laughs> he just needed one. Um, but it seemed that since we changed uh, from aspirin and uh, prasugrel to aspirin and coumadin, it's still open. Uh, I hope it's going to stay like this. So I'm going to give you follow up. Renee, I, I think, I mean, we, we too do the same thing, like dual antiplatelets and then whatever, stopping. I think for the audience, like for the other, like the majority of people only get one stent. Like when we talk about the intracranial hypertension, whatever, I think this is different. I too have had thrombosis uh, in people that have had multiple stents for various reasons, like years out, like this one guy was just needed some dental work done and they stopped his aspirin and he thrombosed his stents and this and that. This guy had two prior incidences of thrombosis under some circumstances, right? So maybe he's not, his, his clotting system is not right to begin with. I would be reluctant to, I don't know, I would probably leave him on Kumadin or a Doak for some time. Oh, yes. <laughs> like a long time. <laughs> okay. um, um, I guess there was a question from Raisa. Would you recommend angiography for all IH patients? I think, Raisa, this is a different patient. This is like not your typical IH patient. At least um, some measurement of the pressure in the sinus gives a lot of information we all i mean we do now like our protocol for if we're gonna stand is like we do lumbar puncture if they haven't had one we do angio pressure measurements followed by the lp but um this is right so this is because this is a venous sinus thrombosis case from the beginning that's why we're talking about this whole business of angio for the sinuses and not the cta or MRA, um, I think it's like what you did is fantastic. Like to get through these things is so hard. <laughs> um, Was it hard, Rene? Like, you know, you show at the final result, but uh, any but trick or like? The right side was quite okay. The only thing is um, the efforts consisted in trying to avoid getting too much on the lateral part of the wall. So trying to stay always in the lumen, this is for the right side, but the right side was a couple of minutes. The left side was an hour. It was really tough, the left side to, to reopen. 
um, difficult to give a recipe. I mean, all this is made in the end with a Thermo 25 stiff. Wait, say again, what's the last thing you said? Thermo 25 stiff, oh. to good approach. It does not work from a femoral approach. So you need to push a lot. I mean, the forces required to go there are high. Do you have any concern that when you stand, um, I mean, in this case, I'm not sure if what the Venus, what the Labays were doing or anything, any concern that we might occlude the inflow? So the first one, yes. Today, no, definitely no. But I would add before standing, we did a cone beam CT to make sure that we did not induce unintentionally a subdural hematoma. I think the risk in getting in reopening sinuses is potentially induce a subdural hematoma. And uh, if you have it at the beginning, um, probably, I don't think it's a drama, <laughs> but if you maintain any platelets and anticoagulation, it will end so. That's why once it's recanalized, and when it's dilated, uh, corn beam CT to make sure that there is no blood uh, where it should not be, and then stenting. Did you see that, Rene? Subdural hematomas? Uh, yes, I saw it. Not in this situation, but one trying to reopen um, occluded sinuses uh, during acute sinus venous thrombosis. And not the first time. Uh, in patients that are really bad, you reopen them the first time, it works quite well, and then they reocclude. You try to do it a second time, and the second and the third time, it happened. It happened once, but it was dramatic. The whole situation was dramatic, but it definitely did not help that patient. I mean, the outcome was... Fatal. Was the subdural supratentorial or, or infratentorial? Infratentorial. I think that's those are obviously probably the most... Uh, so two problems, infratentorial and... Uh, and antiplatelet <laughs> regimen that they're on. So those uh, can become, I never had one, we never had as a group, but uh, you know, I, I've seen these, the few case report and few conversation, those can be extremely, extremely bad. So from, from sinus stenting, um, I heard of hundreds of cases that went on well, but I know two complications, one in the US and one in Europe, where there was a major subdural hematoma and um, very bad consequences. We had once in, uh, um, I think, 600 uh, venous stenting, uh, we had uh, one serious complication and was a, a subdural hematoma and she, uh, well, she survived, but uh, quite a long story. Definitely underreported. Like even in like Victoria, like you have so much experience, one in six hundred. Probably people quote one in one hundred, one in two hundred, in places that do less. But the the population is such that you need a low, very low risk procedure. There is a comment, uh, one in Canada too, um, McMaster. Taylor Duda um, is saying that. And then uh, there were other comments. I don't know, Max, if you went through all the comments, but I think it's worth one. No, Ray is saying that, like, she was saying, like, to clarify, when you see IH, could there be prior thrombosis? Certainly. I mean, I think in general, like, when we, like, as you're saying, like, when we're doing, before stenting, we measure pressure. So we're going to go up there and see how easy it is to catheterize the sinus. Um, typically, um, it's not so hard, obviously, if there's no prior thrombus. There was a comment of like not shunting. I think we, um, Muhammad was asking, are the jugular veins normal? I guess they were normal in this case, right? Renee, there was not like a upper jugular issue or anything. No, we checked this, uh, there was no Eagle syndrome or something like this. The left was much smaller because indeed uh, um, there were several occlusions on the left side and the toughest one was at the junction between sigmoid and left jugular. Any other, anyone wants to like, if you have comments, please just speak up, um, either write or speak.
Um, lysis. Okay. Okay, Charvin's, yes. Um, I mean, I the infratentorial part is the bad part. I mean, good, good. If the outcome is good, I think just in this kind of procedure, uh, if you're before stenting, if you see that there's a hematoma, there's no hurry to do so. You can always do it later on, another time uh, when the patient recovered from uh, the subdural. So totally agree. Yes, jugular approach is mandatory. In this case, you did a jugular approach, or you you said seven seven F jugular. Uh huh. I mean, for the concept of like pushing more, certainly that helps a lot. Otherwise, you lose all the force uh, down below. So PTA, yes, yes, PTA uh, to see what's going on. And by inflating the balloon, you realize where the problem is, where, where the, the stenotic parts are. Now, Rene, why uh, you use the carotid wall stents, right? Or which ones? Yes, carotid wall stents. Okay. Most people use laser cut stents. Uh, we use carotid wall stent because I'm worried about the, the labase being occluded. So I deploy it half like and check how the labe is draining, but that's like a pet peeve. Now, what is, what, what you have other reasons to use the wall stand? Um, experience with it, which is good. And um, it's somehow, it's a breaded stand. So even the sigmoid, if you push uh, strong enough, it will open very, very well. That's why, um, and, and re-navigating through a wall stand is much easier than through an open cell. So uh, think of step two, if you have to reopen, it's gonna be more easy inside the wall stand than a laser cut. As you know, there we might have some dedicated Venus stands coming down the road. Um, at least there's one laser cut and one, um, one uh, braided stent kind of in the works. Well, well, so well stents are resheathable, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Not sometimes they slip off, but usually they're resheathable. We always use wall stent too. You do? <laughs> yeah, always. Because it's we check the labe, of course, and uh, and they, it, it's retreatable. So what 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 we love at this time. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Okay. So Vittorio, you check uh, if the labe feels after you cover it. How often you don't see, you see that it's not uh, draining? Does it oh, happen? Has it uh, happened? Uh, <laughs> I, I I can give you any stats, but uh, if. If we see a, a, a real stagnation in the labe or a real modification of the venous drainage uh, before and after, we we prefer to change the stent. Good, but how often have you seen that? Uh, I mean, uh, you remember often often, often enough to That's decide good. not not to change uh, the stent. No, I mean, but because you, the problem, the, the you've stagnation. Seen you've seen it. You've seen it. We, yes, yes, yes. And the, the yeah. problem is is not that you cover the labe. The problem is that you 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 put the dura and you and you and you and you and you just uh, you know uh, I don't know uh, you 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 lock the, the the entrance of the labe between the stent and the dura, and so so we put in these cases we we, we choose a, a smaller stent. And and usually going. Go, That's an, an extremely go good point. You know, the, the here again, we want to have such a low complication in this kind of population. And anything we can do to reduce that is welcome. Yeah. So you don't try to like reposition this diameter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, we tried. We tried right, first sure. to reposition the stand, and uh, and uh, and then if nothing works, we we change the stand. 
uh, now I, I have to admit, after this complication that happened in the department, we uh, before that we we tried a lot to re, to reposition the stand. Now we try once or twice, and then we change the stand because it was after several times, several uh, efforts to 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 position the stand a little bit better that we had this complication. So, so but we we try always. To, to reposition the stands and and sometimes it works and you 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 really see the drainage uh, going better after the reposition uh nasli has a uh question no nasli so the the wall stand is receivable and reposition and you can reposition uh, of course you 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 don't you don't you don't deploy the stand you just open the stand 80 percent when you can still resheet so if if you if you if you see that the drainage is not good, you just resheet the stent and then re on sheet up to 70-80% when you know you can you can recapture the stent. If if it's fully deployed, you can you can you can do anything. I've seen the question here. Now Raj says something about OptiMed sinus super flex stent. Anyone has experience with that one? No. I don't. Raj, you have any comments about that? So maybe unmute yourself or the only stand that we use is the wall stand in terms of the resheathable ones other than the new ones that are coming hopefully uh, yeah uh, I'm like working in a fellow in a one, one twenty. here we use a sinus optimal uh, stand for the venous release it's a resheathable stand yeah Optimate is available in the U. Like where is it? Uh yeah, yeah. Like in Mont I am currently in Montpellier. Yeah. It's available in Europe. Mm. Okay. Um okay. Any other comments? Any cases? I mean, if there's any appetite for staying a bit longer for more cases. All right. Well, listen, we the had a appetite, fast... the appetite is to go to dinner now because ah. it's <laughs> almost 9 p.m. The session was fantastic. I think <laughs> it was really awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. It's like really, um, I don't know. I think it's outstanding. Great discussion. Um, so more to be had, of course. We'll announce soon about the next one, hopefully, like in a, you know, try to do it like a couple of months or so. Um, oh, there was a question again. Uh, is there a suggested way to do it? Okay. Um, as far as neuroangio.org, okay, uh, you can email me. Just uh, email me um, at uh, like neuroangio at neuroangio.org or shapiro.maxim at neuroangio at uh, gmail.com. Uh, through the through the banana website, you can email me and we can I can clarify. Okay, listen. Thank you again, everybody, for coming for presenting. Uh, it was awesome. Thanks a Thank lot. Thank you all. Take care. Stay Thank well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you very lot. much. That's always beautiful. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.